Say Mount Calvary Baptist Church family and friends. My name is Lady Rose from the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. We are so excited that you have joined us on this day. We will start off today's service with a selection. a word from Pastor Rose. Good day everyone. The scripture text is coming from 1 Kings 21 and 20. 1 Kings 21 and 20 and it reads as follows. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. My topic today is make it right. Make it right. Many of us have cars that we use to go from here to there. We use them to go to the work, to the grocery stores, to transport us, us wherever we need to go that is too long to walk to. If something goes wrong with our cars, there's usually some type of warning. Could be a check engine light, a gauge, it could be an unusual smell or sound. But typically, there is some kind of warning. And the warning gives us the opportunity to fix it, to make our vehicles right. If we don't take advantage of the opportunity of fixing it, many of us have found ourselves with broken down cars stuck and not being able to use them. And so we learn from that and we should know that it's best to fix things as soon as possible rather than face the possible consequences of not. Making it right means to fix something. It means to act upon something that is not the way it should be. And if we are charged to make something right, we are charged to act upon it to correct what may be wrong. There are some things in our life, some relationships, some people that we need to make right. For whatever reason, things may have been said or done that have never been reconciled. And as children of God, we should desire to make it right. For that is what God would want us to do. Let's look at the story and we're going to come back to that. Here we are in, a first, uh, in the book of 1 Kings, which goes through the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. Some of the main uh, events in this book are King David's death, 
King Solomon's reign and the divisions of the kingdom spiritually and physically. And it also talked about Elijah the prophet's ministry. But here in chapter 21, where we are today, is dealing with King Ahab, who is one of the most wicked kings, and it also deals with his wife, the infamous Jezebel. Elijah at this time was a prophet, and he had experienced many conflicts with Ahab and Jezebel during this time. Leading up to this focal scripture today, uh, uh, in the beginning of chapter 21, Ahab wanted a vineyard that was near his palace that was owned by a name by a man named Naboth. <clears throat> king, the king asked uh, Naboth uh, uh, to sell him the land either for money or for a better land in return. Naboth, with the knowledge of the land not being really his, but rather a gift from God to his ancestors, told King Ahab no. Ahab became upset, full of rage. He pouted. He went into his palace. And he was so upset, he refused to eat. And here comes Jezebel, seeing how Ahab was, asked him what was wrong, and, and Ahab told her about the land. Jezebel decided to take matters into her own hands, which Ahab knew, and had Naboth stoned to death, and Ahab then took the land. Now, God, of course, knowing what happened, sent Elijah to Ahab to confront him and let him know the consequence he, his wife, and his family were going to suffer because of it. Now, in verse 27 of this chapter, it states that Ahab humbled himself and God delayed the consequence. However, eventually he still faced uh, what Elijah told him that he would. Now, Ahab allowed, he permitted this awful thing to happen to Naboth. Yes, his wife Jezebel carried out the action, but it is known that Ahab was fully aware of what was going on. And Ahab could have stopped this from happening. He was the king and he was her husband. You know, we, although we may not like to or want to admit it, do not so nice things against one another and other people. Now, yes, we may not be talking about causing someone else's death, but we still have committed offenses against people from lying on them, talking about them, telling them off, saying slick things to them, cursing them out, and the list can go on. And we have done this to our co-workers, our friends, our family members, our own church members, our spouses, you know, just about any and everybody. And the list, can, again, can go on forever and ever. But I've come today to send a message that we need to make things right. And we find that this is a tough thing to do for many of us for a variety of reasons. But as children of God, making, is, making it right is what God expects of us. Well, the question is, what is it that makes us act out against one another? What is it that makes us say slick things to one another? What is it that makes us get an attitude with people? What is it that makes us sin against our very own brothers and sisters? You know, there may be many reasons, but let's focus on a few main ones here as we relate it to the story. Ahab wanted what Naboth had, even though he already had much. And when Ahab could not get it, and Naboth told him no, and told him what he did not want to hear, he allowed his emotions to take over. And if we keep it real, we don't like being told no, and we don't like being told what we don't want to hear either. So again, when Ahab was denied, watch this, he allowed his emotions to take over. It states that he became sullen, he became bad-tempered. Other versions say he became displeased or heavy. He became angry, and along with that comes disgust, because in his mind, how can he be denied? You know, if you do your research on the main emotions that we as human beings have, the main ones are, are the one that are just about in every list are joy, fear, sadness, and then there's disgust and anger. Emotions, if we allow them, can control our reactions to things. Do I have a witness? And the reactions can be good reactions, and they could be also be bad reactions based off of the emotion and whether we're able to control them and or if we allow them to control us. Let me give you an example. I am sure this happened uh, to many of us all the time, you know, at, at times. Someone came up to you and said, I'm about to tell you something, but I need you to stay calm. They knew that whatever they were going to tell you was going to stir up an emotion that could or would cause a reaction from you, but they were pre-telling you to control it. As a matter of fact, your action may have been to them, okay, but I can't promise you nothing, because you even knew that your emotions can make you act in certain ways. 
Many of us act off of our emotions. And that has caused us to say some things to folk that were mean. It caused us to do some things to folk that were hurtful. It caused us to act in a way that was not godly. It caused us to be resentful. It caused some of us to completely end a relationship with someone. And let me show you exactly how this works. Just as we know that people act according to their emotions, guess who else knows that as well? You know, we find in the book of Genesis, when Satan is being described right before the temptation of Eve, the words used were crafty and subtle. You know, subtle means to be so delicate and to be so precise that it's difficult to analyze or recognize. Being subtle and, subtle and crafty is how he tempted Eve. He knew what was gratifying to Eve's eyes. That was the craftiness. And he knew when and how to approach her so she would not recognize his evilness. That's subtle. So Satan, knowing how emotions can affect us, many times waits for those times and sees it as a perfect opportunity to enter the scene. So when someone says or does something to us that causes us to be like Ahab was, which is angry, it is at that moment the door is open for Satan to come in and put thoughts in our minds to tempt us to respond back in a not so godly way. And guess what? We have. We did. We said something. We did something. Because we allowed our emotions to get the best of us. And many of us, after saying what we did or doing what we did, said to ourselves, oh my goodness, why did I say that? Why did I do that? What was I thinking? You weren't. You allowed your emotions to control you and you opened the door for the enemy to come in. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 says this. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. The scripture here is telling us that, ang the, that the anger emotion is going to come. There's no escaping it. It is a part of us. It is natural, but it tells us to be able to control it and not sin. It tells us that anger has the potential to give opportunity to the devil. And you see, when the devil has an opportunity to mess things up, he will. When he has the opportunity to cause havoc, he will. When he has the opportunity to, to mess up relationships, he will. When he has the opportunity to cause us to sin, you better believe that he will take advantage of the opportunity and has. And when he just takes advantage of us not being in control of our emotions, this is when we have hurt some folk. And now we need to make it right. We need to make it right. Well, what else causes us to sin against other people? Well, other people. <laughs> you know, Ahab was angry. He was upset. But the scripture states he was in his room pouting. And based on his characteristics, it was assumed that he probably wasn't going to do anything about Naboth. But then here comes Jezebel. You know, there have been times in our lives where we may have been upset and angry at someone. And we just needed time to cool off as we've done in the past. But then someone came to us and instead of assisting us with the cooling off, they added fuel to the fire. I know we've experienced that. They came in and said, you want to let them get away with that? <laughs> or, or they came in and said, I don't know if I were you, I would have da 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 da. <laughs> you see, we have to remember the enemy is crafty. And if he can't get you one way, he will come to you in another way. He will use other people to get to us to act in a sinful way. But it is in those times that we must recognize and rebuke. If I take you back to Matthew 16, um, this is when Jesus was telling his disciples everything that had to happen to him and everything that was going to go on. And then Peter comes out and says, no way, this is not going to happen. This can't happen. No way is this going to happen. And Jesus looked back at Peter and this is what Jesus said. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Number one, he recognized, he recognized that Satan was using Peter to say this. And he goes on to say, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block, a hindrance to me. 
you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Jesus knew, he recognized that Satan was using Peter. Why? Because Peter was not discussing what the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so he was able to recognize and rebuke. And that's what we have to do. We have to recognize and rebuke so we don't fall into not doing the right things. Saints of God, yes, we have offended people. We have sinned against other people. But please recognize and know that God would want us to make it right. We all mess up and say and do things we should not do against other people, even though we are striving to do right Christians. We're striving always to do right, but we've messed up. Paul stated in Romans 7.15, he says, Sometimes I do not understand my very own actions. For, for sometimes I do not do what I should, but the very things that are not right. Paul says, I, I want to do right. Sometimes, watch this, I can't contain my mouth. So I want to do right, but sometimes I, I do those things that are wrong. He says, I messed up. You know, we fall, but we must make it right. We must do what God wants us to do. You know, 1 Peter 4 and 8, it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. If we are loving one another earnestly, then we are going to strive to make things right with one another. Matter of fact, on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus stated in Matthew 5, 23 through 24, Jesus stated this, he says, So if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, he says, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus was telling us here the importance of reconciliation with our brothers and sisters, with other people. Jesus said, if you're coming to offer the gift, before you do, do what God wants you to do is make things right first with one another. I mean, how can we be representatives of Christ who is love? but don't love our neighbor. That's hypocritical. Matter of fact, 1 John 4 and 20, uh, it says, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, see, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And one of the first, uh, one of the great commandments states to love our neighbor as ourself. And so uh, I'm here to let you know that we need to make it right. And, and now that we know this, Look at what we're reminded in James 4 and 17. James 4 and 17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So now that we know that we need to make it right, and that's what God calls us to do, we need to do it. Because if we don't, now it is a sin. And watch this. Can I say this? So what if the other person is at fault? We are responsible for our own actions and what God wants us to do. We can't tell God we didn't do the right thing because the other person didn't do the right thing. We will have to answer for our own actions. So yes, I, I know we've heard this before, but it's true. Sometimes we have to be the bigger person and swallow our pride. You know, if I keep it real, many of us still don't speak to someone right now because we think that they should apologize first. But you know, that's pride getting in the way. And pride is not of God. Romans 12 and 21 reminds us to not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Just because someone acts evil against us does not give us a pass to act evil against them. But rather we need to overcome that evil with good. Just as Jesus has done, and we do that with, just as Jesus has done, and we do that with the help of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit. If we set our minds on the Spirit, the Spirit will help us bear one another in love. And the scripture says bear because we know it's not easy at times, but we do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. You see, our flesh will tell us to tell someone off, but our spirit says, no, calm down and let's make it right. The Spirit will help us hold in words when the flesh wants those things to come out. 
but we have to stay focused on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will uh, aid us in reconciliation with our brothers and our sisters. And this is why we must rely on God, rely on the Holy Spirit in making things right with people. Ahab allowed his emotions to get the best of him. He allowed other people, Jezebel, to act upon it. And Ahab failed to make it right, and it led to Naboth's death. And so the scripture states that Elijah came to Ahab and said, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Remember, remember when, when, when David took another man's wife and had the, the husband killed, Nathan the prophet came to David and revealed that his sin would be found out. When we do not make things right with people, it always has the potential to catch up with us. Potential, meaning the, having the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. When we make things right, we cut off the legs of potential. The scripture stated that Ahab sold himself to do what was evil in sight of the Lord. Ahab was wicked. Ahab no, he had no intention of making things right. He sold himself to do what was evil. He left that door open for us. When we don't act on things right away, we are allowing them to build up more and more each day. And we are leaving that door open. And what happens is, is that after a while, sometimes we forget about them. And when we forget about it, we never made it right. We never acted on it. And now it has the potential to stay the problem that it is. It has the potential to continue to build up. And then we don't know if something will happen or, or what will happen or, or when it will happen. And I'm here to tell you today that we need to make things right. You know, I, I, I'm done, but I, I just want to tell this uh, short thing that happened. Many of us know that on June 24th of, of this year, there was a big building in Miami that collapsed. And many people have lost their lives, and God rest their souls, and we'll continue to pray for their families as they go and, and look for the bodies. And, you know, I know it's a tough situation. But initial reports state that there was an inspection done about two years ago and the, the engineer went in and they, they noted that there was some structural damage and there were some things that needed to be fixed. Um, and, and now they're saying as they look at it that it's called, it was called a progressive collapse, which was a gradual spread of failures, which means one thing led to another. And, and, and you know, they had that, 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 that list of things that needed to be fixed, but the owners did not act on it. They did not make it right. And they didn't know if, was, if something was going to happen, when something was going to happen, or what, you know, what was going to happen. But because they did not make it right, eventually something happened and the building came crumbling down. They had every opportunity to make it right, but they didn't and it came crumbling down. And I just want to let you know today that you have every opportunity right now to make things right. Do it now. Make it right. Don't wait. I charge you today to make it right. God bless you. Amen. We just now want to offer the opportunity for someone to give their life to Christ. Maybe you have never accepted Christ into your life. Well, Jesus said that no man come to the Father but through me. And there's only one way to get to God, and that is by accepting Christ into your heart. And all you have to do is say the sinner's prayer, and you too can be saved. And if you would like to be saved, all you have to do is repeat after me. Close your eyes and repeat after me. Father, I know that I have come short of the glory of God, and I have sinned. And I admit that. And I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sins so I can have eternal life. And I'm confessing him as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right now. Amen. If you have said those words, we welcome you to the kingdom of God. And we encourage you to get to a Bible-believing and teaching church so you can learn more about the Word of God. God bless you. We would now like to encourage our members of Mount Calvary to send in their tithes and offerings. And if you would like to donate, you can go to our website and click the Donate tab. You will also find on our website our weekly schedule. We hope you have been blessed. God bless.